executive editor of National Review, the publication that this program's original host, William F. Buckley Jr., founded, and that served as a clearinghouse for the ideas that fueled the modern American conservative movement throughout the second half of the 20th century. Indeed, Mr. Executive Editor of National Review, Mr. Salam, is keen to reflect on conservative populism, a party dominated by Donald Trump, and influenced by ideas diverging from the pedigree and intellectual tradition that Buckley bequeathed to his publication. Raihan, a delight to have you here, and I must start with the fact that you're a bit of a prophet. Because in 2008, you and, and the book was entitled Grand New Party, how Republicans didn't really change with those changes in the base. Were you arguing, though, that the ideology of the party had changed or that the party was politicers? And those voters being white working class voters who you identified that I think if I understood your argument, the conservative movement to being a party that was much more unified around a certain version of conservatism, early ideological understanding of conservatism, and one that is open to some of these populist currents. All right, so how does that resonate today in terms of the conservative coalition or the populist coalition? The administration was strikingly different from its predecessors among Republican and moderate ideological currents in the party. If you look at Durius about the George H.W. Bush presidency, they felt as though the party wasn't sufficiently unified, elite level, mm -hmm. and there was a very strong consensus of the Republican Party. If you think about 2004... 1,000 votes in three states. Yep, that's very Wisconsin, well said. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. class before. We have a big problem. Um, Maybe you can outline, you know, some of those pocketbook issues, some of those policies that are the things we care most about in the poorest, most distressed regions. If you're looking at a policy like Medicaid, for example, something that conservatives always talk about federalism of conservatism and whether they actually fit the facts of the way the modern American economy so works. So what are the first principles of conservatism? Gives a lot of room for private initiative, uh, for families, for other voluntary organizations, able foundation mm -hmm. for families to make that kind of progress they need to make before they can uh, pursue their highest ambitions. So in terms of direct policies, wage subsidies? One good example of a wage subsidy that's pretty popular is the earned income. Now, one challenge with the earned income tax credit is that it's more generous to families with less adults, don't get much in the way of a wage subsidy. So they're a country. Or if they're working for most people. Oh, sure. Right? It's not, they're seen as redundant because they're working, because they're able to, to provide a living wage and a, a dignified life for ordinary people, especially the backdrop of a stool with three legs, right? And one of those important legs of the stool is the fiscal conservatism. And fiscal conservatives would ask, against the backdrop of some of the ideas you, you propose, how do you pay for it? Raise some revenue to accommodate um, not just the rising baby, having families with kids who don't feel like they have a sense of buy-in to a dynamic market. Part of the, the DNA of the modern American conservative movement, of um, the sort of inheritors of Buckley's tradition, have been individuals who, who are really concerned about the long-term system debt continues to rise. The deficits continue to be high. Intellectual inheritors of those concerns are going to be. Well, Buckley Jr.'s career, it is striking to see how much his opinion changed on a variety generous to the most own savings and to find other ways in order to meet their needs. Now, is that they have not done that. Rather, what they've said is, rather than saying, hey, if we were approaching this from the 2018 perspective, from a truly modern perspective, in five years or 10 years, I know this bill isn't going to pass. I just want to be able to. Uh, and then guess what happens? Those plans never are passed into law. They never. That you, you find where your political constituency is and then you get to. Is that I see people on the left. And somehow I'm going to get 100 percent of the political system to agree with exactly what I think. And it's, wait a second. The executive branch is not meant to buy in. So I might be a conservative, but I realize that as a conservative, I need deals in my values. And that means speaking not just the other leg of the stool, one of the other legs of the stool of the, the three part stool of the conservative movement, um, this national security, national foreign policy goal that can unite all of the factions. Uh, we see an authoritarian China, we see an authoritarian Russia, but there's also this increased and really outsized focus on Islam amongst conservative populists. Um, I also think it is unambiguously true that Islamic ex actually see the potential for uh, the way that I like to see it is not that China is our enemy. Guys, that a liberalized economy will equal a liberalized government, a liberalized set of Tory uh, as driving all human societies toward freedom, all active tools of repression. One of my favorite parts of this show is incorporating Buckley into 
Do you think a trade war with China is inevitable? I do believe that, hey, we are a late developer. You can envision a more liberal, more democratic, more inclusive Chinese station. Uh, really, the Chinese reckon. So I think that it's naive to think that we're going to have some kind of totally amicable relationship with an authoritarian, oftentimes predatory Chinese government. So then who wins the trade war? Politician and the party that politician represents is really on their side. And I guess where that leaves some of us is wondering whether the conservative movement is any more an intellectual movement driven by ideas. Politics, you know, you'll recall that Donald Trump at one point said, hey, it's the Republican Party, theologically conservative, as that was understood in the not conservatism as it was understood in the Nixon era. So when you talked about that three-legged stool earlier, I guess I see that in my mind, the new economic conservatism has to be about the productive potential of the country as a whole. That certainly relates to the question about investment. If you're looking at the foreign policy piece of it, uh, you know, once I think social conservatives are thinking about national the minorities in this culture and allowing them to to thrive. Well, I believe folks who identify as being on the right, uh, you see this among the Trump voters fall. And they have very different concerns and considerations on issues surrounding um, rights for lesbians and gays, but they're actually more moderate than you actually see some uh, something of a reversal. They might, for some people, I believe they actually are obsessed with race, very narrowly understood. There are other people... Sort of following on that point, President Trump, as we know, uses culture... ...against you rather than a minority against you. And there are... so. From his perspective as an individual, conservatives more broadly, this can be a perilous game to play. We're in this very deeply uncomfortable with Donald Trump. They do not believe that he reflects their values. What I find, if you had a George W. Bush administration, that if you had a Bush administration that when it was approaching the immigration issue didn't say, hey, the, if you had a George W. Bush administration from politics in the subsequent decade. So I've got to say, you know, I have a huge amount of racism that contributed so much to the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of conservatives found themselves turfed. Ryan, thank you for coming to Firing On. I appreciate you being here.